Okay, so we're in 2014. I'm, this is my caveat. I, I've seen the uh, SolarWorks must close, must close screen a little too often lately, so, but I've got a nice, fast hybrid hard drive on this, so it'll, it'll boot right back up real quick. <clears throat> so just to show you just a little history, here's the very first brochure for the very first SolarWorks world, and there's my name with tips and tricks. So this is the 16th time I've done this. And just to kind of prove that I've done it, here's, here's some more evidence. These are all the first slides from all the different tips and tricks over the years. And believe me, I've enjoyed every one of them. And we've experienced our all kinds of things throughout those 16 years. But then they go to the widescreen here in a minute. Let's see. Yep, see, then we start throwing in the wide. So it kind of screwed up the whole diagonal thing. But OK, so enough of that. So what is the definition of a tip or a trick? I mean, there's lots of sessions around here that talk about tips and tricks. So Phil's definition is nothing out of the help file. I'm not going to cut and paste out of the help file and you know reiterate it. But I have, when you've been doing 16 years of tips and tricks, you can't come up with new material quite as quickly as you could at the beginning of the 16 years. So my little caveat is maybe I'll take something out of the help file, but I'll show it to you in a way you've never seen it before, or it's so obscure you'll never even use it again. But, <laughs> but I, I'll show it to you, and I'll call it a tip. OK, so be prepared for a little bit of a obscurity, like this one. OK, let's just get started. And I, as, if you don't know, I do this live, so we're going to stumble a little bit. We're going to back up, and I'll explain why I screwed up, and then we'll get even more tips out of that, right? So this particular problem is it's a curvy surface, curving in two different directions, but the customer wanted to put a grid, like this top view right here, a grid that was perfectly lined up of these little dimples. OK, so the top, and you can kind of see from this edge, the top and bottom is, is curved also. And then you've got this pyramid kind of shape coming off of that. Now, the actual part had. 375 boundary features in it. So I don't think you want to see how to do all 375, so I'll just show you how to do 10 of them. So we start off with this curvy surface, and I'm just going to take it, and I'm going to turn on a display state I've got here. Not that display state. I don't want that at all. I want to turn on. Let's get this out of here. We don't need that. I want to turn on this display state. And I've got a couple of sketches here. Okay. So what I'm going to do basically is I'm going to take a couple of surfaces, and I'm going to do split lines on those surfaces, and then we're going to make some pyramids out of that. So the first thing I want to do is create those surfaces. So I'm going to pick these and go to the surfacing tools. And we're going to offset. And I would like to offset. Uh, 25 thousandths. And I don't think that's enough. No, let's go up bigger than that. Let's go to uh, 125. Yeah, that looks about right. OK, and then I'm going to take those surfaces again, the same original surfaces. And I'm going to offset them again. And this time, I'm going to go 0. So basically, I'm just copying that surface. All right, so if I turn off this body here, and I see some funny things happening in my sketch, which is not good. OK, so we've got two surfaces here. Now let's look into those sketches and see why the sketches are not behaving. Pause the awkward moment. Yeah, my sketch blew up. Let's try. Oh, thank you, thank you. But that didn't seem to help. Hmm, interesting. Well, yeah, but I've got to make those surfaces again. You're, you guys are going to see this all the time. It, it, this, is, this is not starting off good, but I've started off worse. OK, so let's, that one was called, 
That one was called, I just had it multiple something and it was a part, let's see. Yeah, multiple boundaries. Multiple boundary. Turn on, I'm just gonna, let's see, let's do this properly. There we go, okay, they're back. So let's get back up to our surface tool and our offset, and let's do the same thing again. Offset those guys eighth of an inch. Pick them again. I also lost my wireless mouse, if anybody sees a wireless mouse around here. Uh, let's see, and we're going to offset that zero. So we're already into surfacing, right? Okay, so now I'm going to turn off the original body, or hide it, I should say. Okay, so now I've got these sketches. So I want to do some split lines. So I'm going to go insert curve split lines. And let's do the small sketch first. So we're going to project this sketch onto these surfaces. And we're going to split them all at once. And then I'm going to pick these surfaces that are surrounding the sp little split faces. And we're just going to delete that with delete bodies. And we're, we are not going to patch it. So now that we have these little squares, they followed the curvature of those 3D surfaces. And they're just floating above it at that eighth of an inch above that original surface. And then we're going to go back to the same one. <clears throat> and we're going to do insert curve split line. And we're going to pick for the sketch, we're going to pick the outside squares. And then we're going to do, this is that bottom one that had the offset of zero. So we're going to split those. And then we're basically doing the same thing. We're picking the perimeter surfaces and we're going to delete those without patching them. Okay, so now we've got a bunch of new surfaces that we didn't have a minute ago. And we're just going to do boundaries between them. So I'll turn off these sketches now because we no longer need them. And we're just going to quickly do boundaries. 10 of them you can do quickly. 375 you cannot do quickly. So we're just going to go up to our boundary and we want a solid. And we're just going to pick surface to surface. And that's all there is to it. Now, Here's an interesting thing. SolidWorks has changed the way merge result works over the years, OK? At first, back when it functioned improperly, it was more convenient because when you made a weldment, it would uncheck merge result. And you wouldn't have to go back 375 times and pick uncheck merge result. But lately, they've improved it. So the only time you uncheck merge result is when you're actually doing a weldment with structural members. So technically, you have to go back and pick 375 times. You have to uncheck merge result if you don't want it to merge with that original body that is there. But I've also discovered that even though it says merge result, and even though there's a body that it's touching, as long as that body is not showing right now, it's not going to try to merge it. And the try to merge it is the important part, because if it tries to merge it, what we've got is we've got the original curvy surface, and then we've got this other curvy surface, which is the bottom surface I picked here, the larger one. And they're almost going to be touching. Technically, in your mind, they're touching. But in the mathematical mind of SolidWorks, they're, you know, this has one de definition, and this surface has another. And they may not be exactly the same, every point on the entire surface. So SolidWorks is going to have to make that decision. Do I try to merge it, or do I not try to merge it? So you can imagine after 375 attempts, and every time you hit rebuild, it's going to try to decide. OK, trains go by here. It's a little bit further over, I think. Uh, the two surfaces, are going to, it's going to have to make that decision for every point on that surface for the entire 375 boundaries. So for that reason, I would say uncheck merge result. But what I found is it doesn't seem, if the body's not showing, it's not going to try to merge it anyway. So I think we're OK. It's hard to tell on only 10 boundaries whether it's trying to make that decision. But let's just say when it's hidden for now, it doesn't care. So then we can just hit rebuild a couple of times, and we get right back to the, I mean, we can hit enter a couple of times. We get right back to the same command, and we can just do our boundaries fairly rapidly. Now. 
I'll show you something, and I, I cheat, you know, because I've made these nice, easy surfaces. This will just take a, another second. And notice I'm picking, like, between this corner of the surface and this corner of the surface. Let me slow down and do that on the next one. Because we, want, we don't want our boundary to twist. So up here, I get the little green sphere there. And then if, let's say, I pick it over here, see it twists our boundary. So we don't want that. Even though on a boundary, you can just drag it and straighten it out. It's easier if you just you know, pick one and pick the other corresponding corner. OK? And uh, enter, enter. OK, now technically, it didn't try to merge any of those, even though merge result was checked the entire time. And the proof that it didn't try to do that is you, if you go back to your solid bodies, it didn't, it have all of these, uh, it has all of these independent solid bodies now. So to get those to merge, we're just going to select all of the bodies, and not with control, with shift. And then I'm going to go up to the features, and I'm going to combine those, and call them all one body. So now we have one body. So now they did merge. OK, it looks a little funny with some blue surfaces. That's because we still got some surfaces showing, so we're going to hide those. So now we've got one solid body. OK? Make sense? OK, what was I going to tell you? I had one thing I was going to tell Oh, see how I neatly planned it so all of the boundaries hit where there wasn't a stripe going down it and splitting the faces? It actually. I, I don't want to take time right now, but it'll work even if it's crossing it. it. You just have to make sure you pick the corresponding corners, and it should work out just fine. OK, so now what we've got here is what the original intent was. We've got a nice grid that, looking down from the top, is you know x and y perfect. We've got nice squares. The squares are all the same size, top and bottom, but when you look at them from, you know, other angles, they're, they're very weird shaped, but they all come out of a mold. They call, it's actually a casting. So they all come out of the casting. Everything seems to work. It actually looks like, I mean, no, it's a tread for stepping on, so you don't slip. So it, it all functions. It's just they wanted it to look from the top. They wanted it to look like that. And with curve-driven patterns and things like that, it just you know wasn't, uh, wasn't really an option. OK, let's move on. OK, does anybody recognize this? That right there, one hand, two hands? Eh, probably a, a, a quarter, maybe. OK, this is the magical tool that tells SolidWorks to take your toolbox parts and turn them into regular parts. So. PDM or nothing recognizes them as a toolbox part. They're just like any other part. And it's buried deep, and that's why I put the path in here. It's buried deep in your utilities. But it's there in every SOLIDWORKS installation. So I thought I would kind of go through the motions and show you what you need to do to do that. Because a lot of times, if you're in the services business, where you're providing services for somebody else, you don't necessarily want to deliver them toolbox parts, because you don't know what their toolbox library looks like. You don't want to override it. You don't want to screw it up. You just want to give them parts. And you, know, you want your project to stand alone. And then what they do with it after that, they're going to have to figure it out, because they're the ones with their own toolbox library. And if they want to blend it in with that, that's fine. But you can't really blend your toolbox library with their toolbox library you know, in a nice manner. So let's start off with toolbox parts. And you can't see me, but I just went, whew, it worked, OK? So we've got an assembly here, albeit a very simple assembly, but it's got two parts. And we've got two toolbox parts, OK? So what we, our goal is to turn those into non-toolbox parts, OK? Now, my particular setup under toolbox is I have local data for my toolbox parts. In other words, I don't want them going onto a server somewhere because I've got a local machine and I want it to have all my stuff here. That causes other problems. We don't need to get into all that. But the most important thing is this folder, 
I do not necessarily want that to be the default for my toolbox parts, so I uncheck this checkbox. It's checked off by default because when it opens up my files, I don't necessarily want it going back to that specific folder. I want it to go to the exact folder that I'm working in right now. And I'll just, it'll make sense in a minute, okay? So let's leave that unchecked. So we're not going to go look at any specific location for our toolbox parts. So if we go out to File and Find References and go Copy Files, which is just an old-fashioned way to go to Pack and Go, we get to this, and then we're going to include the toolbox parts. So we've got the two parts we had in that assembly, and we are listing the two toolbox parts. And you can see we're uh, coming from, it doesn't really matter where we're coming from, it's grouping them all together, and we're going to browse and put those in somewhere, 2014, and I'll just make, uh, let's see, let's look down here, tips, and let's make a new folder real quick. We'll just call it SSS, and then you kind of have to pick up and then pick back down so it puts SSS right here, right? Everybody knows that little trick. And then we're going to make that new folder. And we're going to say, OK, so it's going to put all of these components, including the toolbox components, in that SSS folder. OK, so I'm copying from where I'm at into a brand new folder, making a copy of my entire assembly, because I'm getting ready. Remember, I'm, tr I'm getting ready to send it to my customer. And I don't want to send them toolbox parts. So I'm going to save that. OK, close that. Now I'm going to close this entire file. and. I don't want to close anything else. Now I'm going to go to my desktop, and I happen to have that little uh, utility right here. And this is what the utility looks like. It's not very descriptive, but I'm going to add files to this tool. Okay, The files I want to add are those two toolbox parts, so we have to go browse for those. Those are going to be here, and then in SSS, so these are the two files that it thinks are toolbox parts. OK, SolidWorks thinks those are toolbox parts. I'm going to open that. Now, what the way this tool works is you can either set a flag, yes or no. Yes means it's yes, it's a toolbox part. No means no, it's not a toolbox part. OK, so I want to change it to no. So SolidWorks does not think it's a toolbox part. So I pick no, and then I say update status. OK, it just changed it. We're done with the utility. We just changed it toolbox flag, yes or no. It's, now it's no for both of those in that SSS folder. OK, so then we close that. Yes, you can change it to yes and then go back. Is it? Well, you can change anything you'd like into a toolbox part if you want to do that. but. This is just, a, all it does is toolbox, yes or no. Um, I mean, some uses for it might be in some kind of a, a PDM environment where you want to rev it or something, and you don't want it to think it's a toolbox part, something like that, if you want to actually rev your fasteners or rev some kind of special uh, you know, part. But this, this is primarily what I use it for. I just want to clean off the toolbox designation so I don't screw up my customer's nice toolbox database. So let's go back. I don't want to follow the prompt because then I would be opening up the wrong file. So now let's open our files on the SSS. And not there, or there, SSS. So now I'm going to open up my assembly. <coughs> And remember the flag we unchecked, so it's not going to go off and look at my toolbox database. Because actually, if that was checked, see, now it's going to go look at my toolbox database. And if it has a file name the same as in this assembly, it's going to use that toolbox definition. So that's why we unchecked that. We wanted to open it up using the files only in this folder. So I'm going to open it up. And now, magically, we have no toolbox. So that's all we did. All of that rigmarole was to Turn it from toolbox to no toolbox. Where do you find your utility? It was right here. It's it's here. It's all you know. 
I install my stuff under 2014. I always I have like 2013, 2014. So it's in your toolbox installation path, and it's it's in there for every version of SolidWorks. And it's this is the name of it. This SLD set doc prop dot exe. And I haven't given this to SolidWorks yet. I, I always like to make them beg for my presentation. Uh, interesting story. I, I got to tell this one. I'm, I'm going to take way too long on all this stuff. Um, when I submitted, I like, to, I like to play games when I submit my presentation. So like last year, I didn't submit, and I, I waited for them to come begging to see if I would do a presentation. And that worked. They came begging. And then this year, I tried something different. I didn't want to do the same old thing. So this year, if you've ever done a presentation, you have to fill out an abstract and a, a benefits for attendees. It's like, you know, 50 words or less, you know, you have to fill out the abstract. Well, this year I put TBD just to see if they'd <laughs> accept it. And I was accepted on TBD, so. <laughs> Richard Doyle got a laugh out of that, but they accepted me. So I, I got to think of something new to do next year, too. Okay, let's, let's enough of the, the funny stuff. It'll be funny enough just going through it. Okay, now, this is a tip I've showed before, okay? But when you see this little 2014 edition, that means that something happened in 2014 that changed this. It almost obsoleted this, but in this case, it made it, it made it better, it made it more accurate, and let's just dig into it. The object is we want to make an explode, okay? And the particular explode we have has wires in it. Okay, that's, it's kind of obscure. This is one of those obscure things. But when you're exploding wires, it doesn't work. The SolidWorks needs some coaxing. It doesn't do it very cleanly because usually in an explode, you're just taking components and moving them. Or ro in 2014, you can rotate them. But it doesn't, what does it do with wires? Because wires in an explode view, you really don't explode the wires, right? In this case, up here, this example, You've got a service loop, and then when you explode them, you you know the wire stretches out. That's probably the way you would want to show that. And then in some cases, the you would want to put it at a right angle, which was difficult to do in 2013. And then the wire kind of bends around the corner. So so let's look at this with the 2014 perspective and see what what we're doing. So let's open up an assembly, and I just went whew, again, okay? So here's what we're dealing with. Here's the primary components. We've got a left and a right hand housing, distal and, and proximal for you medical people out there. Proximal is the one closest to the surgeon. Just That's what you have to keep in mind. The, the, the surgeon is proximal. The distal is the patient, okay? So we've got this guy right here, and we're going to explode it. And then we're going to show it closed, exploded, and, uh, and then at the angle, okay. So here's our three pieces of wire that we'd like to put into our views, okay. So let's go to our defaults, and let's, let's do the default first. That's unexploded. So I'm going to pick this guy, and I'm going to kind of cheat on the, the mates here. I'm just going to do real sloppy mates. Pick those two guys, make it coincident. Okay, so that's, that's it. We're done with the unexploded version, okay? So now let's work on an exploded view. So let's go add configuration, and we'll just call it 111. Okay, one too many ones, that's okay. All right, and now we're going to do an exploded view. So we're right up here, new exploded view. I think I have to cheat. Well, I might, let, let's just keep going. Um, so... Let's pick these two components, and let's explode those. And I'm going to drag them out in this direction. And I think I want to go three inches exactly. But the nice way SOLIDWORKS does it is I didn't do it in the right order, so I have to actually go in here and edit this step and change it to three inches. And then done. OK, so now we've exploded it exactly three inches, right? So now we're in this configuration, so we're going to, let's just hide this guy. And now we're going to use this guy, so let's put him in there. And it, it temporarily unexplodes when you're doing mates, so let's deal with that. 
and then it pops back out after you're done with the mate. So there's our exploded view for 2014. We could do that in 2013 also, okay? So now let's make the third one. Add configuration. Let's just call it 222. Now, this one is different. Let's hide this guy because we're not going to use him anymore. We're going to use this guy. And let's actually put him in position because I, uh, that might help me figure, remember what the distances are better. Uh, let me try that again. Pops up. Coincident. OK, so we've got to bring these components. So let's add a new exploded view to this configuration. And we're going to pick this. And we're going to pick this. And we're going to go out and see that this is, I got to, I'm not real good at this, but let's edit it again. And we want to go out 1.5. Now, if you haven't noticed it already, there's a sketch right here. And it's an assembly sketch, so I can't change the color and make it bright. But what that assembly sketch does is it's giving me a guideline because the next thing I want to do that's 2014 is I can rotate inside of an exploded view, right? I can tell it to translate or I can tell it to rotate. So let's go back to this exploded view, edit the feature, and we're going to actually pick this component and this component, and we're going to rotate, <coughs> okay? And this is where I'm probably going to screw it up. I want to rotate around this line in the sketch. And I would like to rotate it around. And I want it to do 90 degrees. And then I'm going to say OK and see what happens. OK, pretty good, pretty good. We, it was like not quite 90, but close enough. OK, now I've got to move it down again. So I'm going to add one more step. And I'm going to say uh, this guy and this guy, and I'm just going to do it by eye. Let's say it drags down to there, OK? OK, so now we've got our exploded view. So unexploded, it's there. Exploded, it's there. And we've got our wire in place. OK, so that's, that's new for 2014. You, to do this in 2013, you'd have to take it and you'd have to make another configuration with one component exploding straight out like before and another entire instance of that same component and put it down and you know, hide and show as you switch configurations. OK, now there's one more thing you can do in 2014 that you couldn't do in 2013. If we go out to these components and we look at this guy, it's just a sweep along a spline. Well, guess what? We can dimension a spline now. So I can add a dimension to this. I, I get to mention SOLIDWORKS Mechanical Conceptual. In SOLIDWORKS Mechanical Conceptual, I don't have to go get the dimension tool. I can just pick it. But here I have to pick the dimension tool. So anyway, I want to change the length of this because that wire that is either as a service loop or expanded in one exploded view or expanded in another exploded view, it's always going to be the same length, right? So now you, all your managers know that you can make your wires the exact length in every single configuration. And that they'll love that. They'll, they'll want you to spend all that extra time making all your wires exactly the right length. So I'm going to change this to 6.25. So now our wire is exactly 6.25 long. Go to that one. Go back to our assembly, which is here. And so now we know that this is exactly the right length. And then we just go to our other configuration. So there's our, oh, and then we have to hide the one we did there. So we got to get our configurations just right. And remember, this one has an exploded view. That's why it wasn't lined up. So now we can go out to this component and go out to this component. And we can edit that one. And we can edit our path. And we can add, make that exactly 6.25 also. See, isn't this detail you just want to add to every one of your assemblies when you get back? You want to make all your wires exactly the right length. It's so critical. But this, this is new, t you know, new uh, functionality. So, and then in this particular case, our wire just has two different configs. So let's go to this guy. And then we'll go back to our sweep. And we'll add that. I mean, edit that. And we can add 
our dimension to this as well. This one's a little too long, 6.25. Everybody's happy. So now if we go back to our assembly. Okay, there's that one. There's that one. And there's the default. We just got to hide a few things because we didn't hide them before. So now all our configurations are exactly correct and all the wires are exactly the same length. You've always wanted to do that, right? And th the other question, I, I probably about three quarters of yes, I played with those splines for hours to make sure I could change the dimension and they'd all be the same. It was, it, well, not hours, minutes at least. I mean, it was difficult to get them all so, you know, they wouldn't blow up on me as this. So anyway, that's, that's new functionality in 2014, but it's kind of show, see, it's showing you something that you won't, you're not going to be able to look up in the help file. What do I do when you, you know, I want to explode and there's wires involved? So nothing out of the help file there. Okay? That all make sense? How many would actually use something like, how many explode wires? Eh, not too many, but it's a pretty difficult task, especially when you have a six foot long heart catheter. That's where the proximal and distal thing comes from. And the wires are seven thousandths diameter and they're six feet long. There's a lot of service loops. And then there's tubing with the, that carries fluids and then there's electrodes and there's thermocouple wires. There's all kinds of stuff. I'm sorry? Yeah, it, the spline is what you're dimensioning. So you could treat that as a tubing or whatever you want. I've got a, actually, I've got another tip for, for long sweeps that's actually more descriptive than this for long, skinny things with lots of sweeps. Okay, this is another 2014 thing. I just want to show you the purpose of one of the new features in 2014 that you may not have thought about already, okay? Yeah. The, uh, the yes. No, just splines. The, he, he asked if the linear length had to do with helixes also, and it, no, it's just unless you want to make your own helix out of a 3D spline and go through all the points through. You could do a helix as a guide curve or as a point to connect your spline to, but no. Okay, so th this one's, this one's uh, interesting. And this is, as soon as I saw this in the 2014, you know, hit list of new things, I, this is immediately thought of this. And maybe you did too. Okay, so what I've got here is I've got a solid that I turned into a couple of sheet metal parts, okay? So if you just wanna quickly go through it, I can just roll it back and, and so, when you're doing this and you've got multiple sheet metal parts, you, there's a, there's a checkbox you got to watch. So, so if we convert to sheet metal, and let's, I just want to hit that real quick to show you this one thing. Uh, not with that feature though. Where's the convert? There it is. With this feature here, there's a checkbox here that says keep body. Okay, that's going to hang you up because you start off with a solid and you convert some of the edges and some of the faces into a sheet metal part and then your body goes away. So now you don't have a, a, a solid body of, to do the other sheet metal part. So you can either uncheck this, or I mean, I'm sorry, check this, and by default I believe it's unchecked, or you can do it the old fashioned way and you can just copy that body right off the bat. So in other words, I took my little trapezoidal, whatever shape you want to call this, and I was going to convert that into two different sheet metal parts, and so I took that and I copied it first and then made two sheet metal parts. That's basically what I want to show you here. And then, then we come down to the bottom and we added some holes for fasteners because we want to put PIMS and we want to turn this into an assembly, right? So we do a save body. So I'm going to come up to my cut list. Somehow it got a cut list there because I probably tried to play around with Weldman in here somewhere. Anyway, that's not important. I'm going to save bodies. And I'm going to pick the two bodies. And I've called them upper and lower conveniently. And I'm going to actually create an assembly at the same time. 
let's put them out on a funny folder too. Let's see. Let's uh, let's just create a new folder here. Let's call this one uh, TTT. Oops, I didn't do that right. Open the new, oh good, it didn't do anything. There, now it should work. Save. Oh, okay, if you insist. Okay, so this is the assembly we're naming, TTT. Okay, and that put it down here, and then we're gonna say okay. So remember, we're in the multi-body part right now. And there's one of the saved body, or one of the saved parts. Okay, now we're back in the multi-body. So let's get out of this. Up, oh, I was just there. Open. Let's find that T, that TT one. Okay, so here's our assembly now, and it's it's derived from the the master part, right? Okay, so now I'm going to quickly add some things. Oh, first of all, I, I don't want to add things. I want to make up. I want to make a drawing because this is what I'm trying to show you guys. So I'm going to make a drawing from this assembly. And I'm going to quickly make some views if I can pick the right button here. Let's make an isometric. And then I also want to make some views of the parts, so let's quickly go to views. Quickly in my, you know, quickly might not be quite quick enough for you guys, but let's pick one that lower. Okay, and that's the important one. So let's do the lower. So I'll, I'll tell you what's going on ahead of time. We don't have any fasteners in this lower yet. This is just a single part, right? So now let's go back to our assembly. Let's, let's turn on shaded so you can see that a little better. Let's go back to our assembly. Now let's add some fasteners. So I'm gonna temporarily hide that. And I'm gonna pick, let's just pick these inside four edges. And then we're gonna go up to our toolbox real quick and we're gonna put some PIMS in there. So we're gonna come down to PIMS. And we want nuts and non-locking. Let's just put some of these, insert into assembly. And I don't care what it puts in, whatever it decides it likes, we'll take it. Okay, so now we've got that. And then we'll turn back on our cover and we'll quickly put some fasteners in there because I, I want to show you the difference between the two fasteners. So now let's go back to our toolbox up here. Inches, screws, machine screws. And let's just put some cross heads in there. Insert into assembly. They have to be just a little bit longer. Okay, so now we've got ourselves an assembly, right? We can put this thing together. Okay, but we need a subassembly because we're talking about the PIMS and the sheet metal need to go together, right? So let's create a subassembly there. Let's go to our four PIMS, and then let's go to our lower part, and we're going to form a subassembly here. Okay, so we're, and uh, yes, we can move that. So now we've got our subassembly with the lower, the lower and the four PIMS, and then everything else is in the top level. That's just what we want, right? Okay, remember we made that drawing back then? That's a, that's a problem, right? Because we made the drawing of the sheet metal all by itself, and now we've got a subassembly that we really want to pop into that drawing, but we've already done the drawing. And what I forgot to do is I forgot to throw a bunch of dimensions on that single sheet metal part. So let's pretend I threw a bunch of dimensions on that sheet metal part, and let's go back to that, <coughs> that file. And... Uh, who knows where it is, that's probably it. Okay, so let's pretend there's some, I think I can actually throw dimensions on it now. Let's just throw a couple of dimensions just to say we did. Okay, so you've got this all dimensioned up and it's all perfect, but you said, oops, I forgot the PEMS, right? Well, the, okay, now we're finally to the grand finale. The, 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 the good stuff you can do in 14 now is you can right click on the view and you can say replace the model. And I'm going to replace that model with 
our subassembly, which I did not save externally, so we can't do it yet. <laughs> see, this is what's so ed. See, you guys get to see somebody else screwing up, and you get to learn even more. That you can't. It's internal. Remember, I created a new sum assembly. It's internal to that assembly. So we're talking about a whole different subjects now. So now let's go back out to our document, which is here. And then we're going to rename it first. Let's rename it to something we'll recognize. So let's call it RRR. And then we'll save it externally. OK, now we can go back to our drawing. And now we can replace our model. And we can browse for it. And we're going to look for our, our, our assembly. So we're going from a part to an assembly. And the PIMs pop in, and the dimensions stay right where they came from. So that's, that's the whole, this whole five minute conversation was just to ex show you that. But see, now you see a practical use for that particular 2014 feature. You didn't come here to see perfection, right? You came here to just watch me uh, make these types of uh, obscure things. OK, that all makes sense. All right. so. I combed the, uh, what's the top 10 list called these days for 2015 enhancements? I, I combed that, whatever it's called these days, and I found something called pl platonic solids. OK, so they're basically things like, I, they look like molecule shapes or something. I don't, I don't know the math behind it, but there's shapes like this. And they said they're really hard to make now. We need to make them easy in 2015. So I looked at this, and I said, well, that, those aren't that hard. So let, let's look at some of those. So let's just go back to PowerPoint real quick. So basically, we've got this 109 degree angle. And then it's like if you drew flat surfaces on, between all these spheres. So we've got 109 degrees. And then we've got three of them. And then we've got a flat bottom. So it's like a real funny pyramid, right? Three-sided pyramid. Well, yeah, so if you get out the extrude and the sketches, it's going to be kind of cumbersome to make one because you're going to have to you know, cut it and trim it and get it just the right angle for the you know, draft or whatever. You know, it's going to be kind of hard. But let's use some surfaces. OK, so here's my first sketch. Let's look at it like from the front view. So there's our 109 degree angle. Let me just double click on it so you can see it. There's our 109 degree angle. OK. So I'm going to take that, and I'm just going to make a surface out of that. Just go to our surface tools, go to planar surface, pick that, make a surface out of it. There's our planar surface. Okay. Now, remember, we had three different sides. So I'm just going to pattern that. That's just a circular pattern. The axis of rotation, I'm going to turn off the sketch, by the way. Let's turn off the sketch so we can't see it. And our axis of rotation is just that edge on that surface. And I just want three. And we don't want to do a feature. We want to do a body. So we come down here to body. And we want to do three equal spaces. So there's our three surfaces. Now, those are really what I would call construction surfaces, because those aren't actually in our solid. So now we're going to have to add some more surfaces. And you say, well, that's, that's no fun. But look at how easy it is. Just pick two edges, and you get a planar surface. OK, so now we take that surface, and I'm trying to rotate it so you guys can kind of get oriented. So I'm going to take that surface, and I'm going to take and uh, do a circular pattern again. And I've got the axis of rotation is that same edge. And this time I want three of them, and I want that guy right there. And we're going to say OK. So now we've got some surfaces that are going to turn into our solid. We've got one more surface. That's the bottom one. That's another planar surface. We just need to go between two edges. Say OK. So now we've got all the edges we want. It's a little hard to see because the part is blue. By, by the way, I've got, a, I've got a complaint. 
Every year, SolidWorks gives you slides and the PowerPoint slides to go by. That's where you get all the that Dassault Systems, you know, the 3D experience compass. That was they issued that to us. So they also have colors, and I like to make all my part colors the same as the slide colors, so it all matches. Nobody else probably does that, but I like to do that. And the colors this year really sucked. They didn't give us a very good selection of colors. I do have the color, if you look in uh, appearances, I, I do have the color swatch for 2014, but see, it's a very, it's, it sucks. There, there's blue, gray, and red. I mean, you know, who wants that? So that's how this ended up, this funny blue, and that's why you can't see the blue edges on this, because there's surfaces at this point, and you can't, they're not black edges because they're not joined. They're touching, but they're not, they're, they're not knit together. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to knit them together. So I'm going to pick these four surfaces, and I'm ignoring those ones on the inside because they don't really matter. I would like to try and form a solid. And it did. So now you can see the black edges. So that's what you're used to looking at when solids, right? So there, there it is. There's your platonic shape. And it, we didn't use any extrudes or cuts or anything. We just used surfaces. You know, they're flat surfaces, but they're still surfaces. Okay, so then we could quickly repeat that. You could see how I do it here, too. It's the same basic idea, so we'll skip that one. But anybody that's anybody knows how to make a soccer ball in SolidWorks, and it's not as easy as it sounds. So I, I, I don't want to make it for you from scratch, but I want to show you how to do it, and I'll put it in my presentation so you can copy it. That, you know, that's like a, a, a party trick, make a soccer ball, right? And one of my biggest customers, they, they've netted me more income than anybody over the last 10 years, and Mickey's probably in the room somewhere. Is Mickey somewhere? No, he's not. Anyway, I met him way, way back when I was teaching SolidWorks for the first couple of years I was teaching SolidWorks. And he walked straight up to me after class and says, how do you make a soccer ball? And I could not make a soccer ball for him. I got back to him and I figured out how to make a soccer ball the next day, but I didn't know on the spot how to make a soccer ball. So ever since then, I, I've been prepared. If anybody else ever walks up to me and says, how do you make a soccer ball, I can make a soccer ball. And that cust he turned into one of my best customers and, he, and he's, he's been a customer for years. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, soccer balls are kind of platonic as well. So the first thing we're going to do, let's see. How come these are all suppressed? Let's unsuppress these. And we'll just kind of step you through it because it, it's, it's kind of a little bit tedious, but I want to show you anyway. So you start off, how washed out is that sketch? Pretty washed out, isn't it? Start off with this sketch. And the sketch is basically two pentagons, and one is twice as big as the other one, and they're concentric, okay? So that's what we start off with. And you make a planar surface out of the smaller one. Because soccer balls are pentagon and hexagons, right? So you make that one. And then we're going to make this other sketch right off of that. And that sketch is on the front plane, just like that. I guess it's the right plane in this model, OK? So it's just a planar sketch. And it's going from this point right here on our first pentagon down to this point. And if we look at this from the top, I'm sorry, not from the top view, from the right view, this point is vertical with that point. And so that determines the length of that and the angle. Okay? That's just on that right plane, right there. Okay? And then from there, you draw another plane, and that plane is based on that line and maybe this point over here. So now you've got a plane at that angle. Okay, and on that plane, you add your first, and let me change the background, because that's uh, not a good background. Oh, that's not real good either. I guess you can see that okay, huh? I don't think there's a darker background. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so we for, the, now we made, made another planar surface based on that hexagon, and that hexagon is one of the lengths is the same as that. Okay? This will come in handy someday. You'll, you'll need this. And then we're going to make an axis going right up the middle. And maybe we made a, you know, we took one of the points on the sketch and went normal to that face and got that axis. And then we did a circular pattern of that hexagon. Okay? Then we made another plane 
and that plane was based on the angle that's made between those two hexagons. Because now we're going to get ready to put another pentagon on there, right? So let's do that. Put another pentagon on there. Got it? And then we do a pattern of that. And so on. We make another plane. Make another hexagon now. We're due for a hexagon. And then we pattern that. Okay, we're more than halfway done. Because the center of the the ball is right about here. Mid the, it's the midpoint of this guy. So then we're going to put a plane right at that midpoint. Okay, follow me? And then we're going to mirror the, all those bodies we just created. Okay, so that just mirrored them. That doesn't look like a soccer ball yet. There's, there's, there's gaps in them. But we're just going to move the bodies. Actually, we're going to rotate them so they all line up. So now we've got the entire soccer ball. And then we're going to knit them together into a solid. And there you go. Now you can amaze your friends with your party tricks of making a soccer ball. Yes. OK, you're talking about this, this one that went kind of down at an angle? OK, let's just roll back real quick. Yeah, that's the key to the whole thing. So we had the original sketch, the two pentagons that were twice as big, one was twice as big as the other one. Every edge on it was twice as big as the other one. And then the sketch, let's just open it up. And it was on that right plane. So I just drew a line from that point right there, coincident with that point, down to here. And that was perfectly vertical with that point on the larger of the two pentagons in the first sketch. So that determined the angle and that determined the length of that line by just being horizontal. Does that make, does that make sense yet? And remember, the right, the right plane is key because, see, you're, you're on that plane when you're drawing the sketch. So you go from there, and then you come back up to your sketch, and you make those two points vertical. And that lays out the first primary angle. <laughs> Soccer ball questions. <laughs> OK. Yes? I'm sorry? Uh, I couldn't tell you that. <laughs> It doesn't have any air in it either. <laughs> it's actually a solid, so it's homogeneous. There's no air at all. It, it would bounce really good if you get hit a hard enough surface. Yeah, they, they, I mean, you could go buy the easiest way is just buy a soccer ball if you don't believe me. You know, but that's pretty much what it looks like. Okay. So I, I kind of put that in it. That's called. That's got to be like close to a platonic, like the other ones. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's see, four thirty, five thirty, half an hour. I put all the new cool stuff at the beginning, and I put all the kind of repeat stuff at the end. So that way, when I run out of time, not if, but when I run out of time, you'll just miss the stuff that wasn't quite as cool. OK, so pocket screws and biscuits. If you do it woodworking, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Pocket screws are these things down here. And I hope I opened up this assembly. If not, we'll have a brief pause while SolidWorks restarts. Yes, I did. OK. So what pocket screws do, they're for screwing. Real woodworkers don't use pocket screws, but woodworkers like me do because they're really quick. They're really easy. You get really good alignment, but there's metal fasteners in your wood, and that's not real woodworking. But you drill a funny hole. It's like a counterboard hole into the first piece of wood, which in this case would be this guy. And the drilled hole stops right at the joint. And then the screw goes into the hole and drives it home. And you usually, on something like this, you'd put like two of them, one here and one here. And so the counterboard hole is really only on this part right here. OK, so the other component really doesn't get any of the drill. And they've got a special jig they'd use when you're doing it in real life. And it make, it's like a stepped drill, so it drills the perfect size screw or drill for the screw threads, and then it drew, drills another one for the head of the screw to counterbore in. 
And then if you're really fancy, they make these little special wooden plugs that you plug up the hole that you just made so it doesn't look like there's any screws in your part, okay? So what I've done here is, this is what it's gonna look like when we're done. I've just made what's called some smart components. Remember smart components? And smart components work well if it's only modif- in other words, we're gonna do that stepped drill feature using the smart components. I think I'm using the right terminology. Is that? Smart features, smart Smart, yeah, smart features, I'm sorry. Don't like to use wrong. We've added smart features to this component, so anyway, I'm gonna position those, and then we're gonna create the feature in the, this piece of wood, and we're also gonna insert another component, which is the plug that plugs it up. So real quick, I know I'm talking too much and hand-waving, but let's, uh, let's add one of these, and I've just got it set up so it's really easy to mate. And then I'm gonna pick uh, this plane and pick it on that surface, make that coincident as well. And we'll just put in one, but generally there's two of them. Okay, so now you just go up to the, com com the component that has the smart features and you say insert smart features. And it just wants to know, okay, which component do you want to apply this to? So it's going to be this face, and then it's done. And I say, okay, and it's done. So now let's make this transparent so you can see what happened. It added the screw, it made the feature in the component I was wanting, I specified, and then it added this other component in our assembly that's the plug for it. Okay. So that works well, but you've got to kind of think about this because a lot of woodworking, it's, it would be considered an assembly feature, right? You don't really want to drill the holes or something before you have both pieces of wood in the same place and you kind of match drill things, right? So some woodworking things are better depicted that way. In this case though, you could drill the holes ahead of time because the hole only goes through this one component and then when you assemble it, you put it in a special clamp and you, and you drive the screw home and everything's copacetic. So in this case, a smart component or a smart feature to a component works well. Okay, another common tool in woodworking, and it's a little bit classier than a pocket screw in the, in the pecking order of woodworking joints, uh, is called a biscuit. And it's basically a football thing and you put a little slot in two components. In this case, it would be like for this and this component. And you put a little football shaped slot in that and then you lather it full of glue and you put it in there and it swells up and it makes a really clean, uh, sharp, aligned joint, okay? But think about it, we have to put a feature in both of these, okay? So that's a shortcoming of the smart component. You cannot have it put features in two different parts at the same time, or at least I couldn't figure out how to make it do that. So this, we're gonna to resort to our assembly feature. Okay, so just real quickly, I'm going to take these guys and I'm gonna mate that to that face, to that plane, and then I'll just kinda of drag it into place by eye. It's, I think I've got it pretty close now. Let's turn these two guys to transparent so you can see what's going on. Okay, so basically that you center this just right. and It's got a special, uh, you know, usually it, it looks kind of like a router, but it, it does those. So we've got to get those pockets in that, both of those components. So we're going to use an assembly feature. Well, to do an assembly feature, we have to have an assembly sketch. I'm losing on all the non-woodworkers now. They're all leaving. We've talked too much about one subject. So here we go. We're going to uh, uh, insert a sketch, and we're gonna put the sketch on this plane right here. And this is neat, this is new for 2014. This is kinda neat. It's warning me that I'm opening a sketch in the assembly. In other words, sometimes you, you, you're trying to add a feature to a specific part, so you should be editing that part, right? So it gives you this little warning, but we, we're, we know, we, we, we want this assembly. So then I'm gonna take this, and uh, I also have a sketch in that biscuit, which is right here, and I'm gonna take that, and I'm going to take that sketch right there, and I'm gonna convert that, 
And now we've got that shape in our assembly sketch. And now I'm going to use an assembly feature. Insert, assembly feature, cut, extrude. And I'm going to do a mid-plane because we want to go through in both directions. And we would like to make that wide enough for the biscuit. And the other important thing here is we, do want, we want to specify what we're doing the cut in because we don't want to cut our biscuit away. We just want to cut the two pieces of wood away because there's three components here we're talking about. So we're going to specify those two components, do the assembly cut, and there we've got the assembly cut. And we've got our components. So that wasn't quite as slick as the smart component, but there's no way I could have cut both of those components at the same time with a smart feature. That almost makes sense? OK, now, now what I didn't think about too much here is how you want to do this if it was a production environment. If I was laying this out, I would cut the two pieces of wood, and then I'd, right before I assemble it, I'd cut the slots for the biscuits. So that would truly be an assembly feature. I wouldn't want the dimensions of that slot on my detail of that piece of wood. I wouldn't want them to try to cut those ahead of time. But I could see some instances where you had it very planned out and you're in a production environment, you would want to do that. So you could do that by going back and taking your assembly feature and propagating it to the parts. So then you could align everything in your assembly, but then propagate it back out to the parts, because it really has to do with both parts at the same time. So you have to kind of think of, when do I want to put that feature in? So that would, have, that would uh, have something to do with it, too. OK, so does that all make sense? Now, now you know I know a little bit about something other than just SolidWorks. OK. Now, this is that long, narrow components. And we're, this is a super problem. Over here is an example of one of our assemblies that we've done, and it's taken us years to develop this assembly. The customer can't even open up the files on their computers. They just take our files, zip them up, and put them in their PDM. They don't even try to open them, which is kind of good for us. But, but this particular assembly, it's probably uh, two, 300 components, but look at all the configurations. And each configuration has derived configurations. And each configuration has its own exploded configurations. And this is one configuration with all those display states. What this is meaning, this is, we've got a six-foot heart catheter with 7,000th diameter wires running from one end to the other all the way. And there's multiples. There's probably a group of 15 or 20 wires. And we got to make sweeps going the entire length, right? So that, that's actually quite a problem. So this is kind of one technique that you might be able to mitigate that with. <clears throat> because to do it, if you, if you just said, I want to match exactly reality, it's just never going to work. You're going to bog down. This, this particular assembly has 48 drawings that goes with this one assembly. And we didn't try It's a 48-page long drawing, but they're not all in one file. Each, each sheet has a separate file. So here's, here's my idea. Let's, let's go out and look at it kind of from the beginning, because th this is really neat. I, I think this is really a good technique if this is the kind of, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. There's that, that's there's that AutoCAD stuff. I said oops again. Remember the oops command in AutoCAD? Uh, we don't want to edit this. We just want to go out to that file. Let's see. Let's just open it. Because this is key to the whole understanding. Let's see, we want to go back to 2014, go back to parts, and uh, what did I just call it? Master, master. L amp master. OK, so this is the key to the whole thing. This is a part, OK? It's, think of it like an aircraft bulkhead. So we've got a, it starts at 0 here. Then we've got all these bulkheads. So these represent different cross sections of our finished catheter, right? So we're going to only design 
each bulkhead. It's kind of like how they put a ship together. They make all the different sections, and then they all come together at the end, and they all fit perfectly together. All the tubes line up, everything lines up. So it's kind of like that. So let's just say that, I mean, of course, this is a very simplified version. This is our bulkhead. This is the shape of the outside. This is where the wires are going to go through, or the tubing, whatever you want to call it. And then we've got the same bulkhead down here, and that maybe they're slightly different positions. So you've got to think way ahead on this. But, but really, this three years or t or t of me working on this is telling you that this might be the best way for you to go. So you make all these bulkhead stations, right? And it goes on for six feet, and there's probably 30 or 40 of these bulkheads. But we have a single part defining where all those bulkheads are. And that's the purpose of this part, is just tell me where the bulkheads are, tell me where the interfaces between the wires are. And you probably have to have some notes scribbled off to the side to remind you what everything does, but this is going to define everything, OK? So then we're going to come back to our assembly, if I can find it. Uh, here. Okay, so here I've got two completed sections, and of course they're a lot shorter, a lot simpler than the real world. So now we want to make the section that's missing. Okay, so this section is, if this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, so we want to make it between two and three. So I'm going to create a brand new part. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a part. And that part I'm going to bring in is the master, which you probably see it, but I don't. Yeah, oh, it's already highlighted. Master. OK, now remember, that was just a bunch of sketches. There actually weren't any solid features in that. So I'm going to insert that. And here we have the choice of what we're going to bring in. Well, we don't even have to bring in solid bodies because we don't have any solid bodies to bring in. We're just going to bring in this, the unabsorbed sketches and the planes. That's all we're really interested in. So this is what it looks like when we bring it in. Now we can use that to create our part. So we're going to make a part that goes between section 2 and section 3. And it's just going to be a single part. Now, this is going to screw up your bill of materials. You're not going to have an accurate bill of materials. But when you have a six foot long heart catheter, with 200 parts in it, your, your bill of material is not going to be right away because you have to do so many tricks and so many configurations and s just to get all the drawing views. So this is, this is cheating. This isn't reality, but it's the only way to make this efficiently. And, and uh, you know, so you can open it up with a, in a you know, decent amount of time. So if you're, out, if you're the type that has to make everything perfect and make it match your BOM, it's just not going to work. But this, this is a much more efficient way to do it. So let's just take this, just for example, I'll just do this real quick because I know you're catching on to what I'm doing. So let's just open another 3D sketch in here. And let's make some, uh, some things going from here to here. And I did want to show you uh, one other thing. So if you want these all to be perpendicular, you can draw some orthogonal lines at both ends. And then you can add some tangencies to that. And that way, you know, at the bulkheads, they'll appear to be going straight through. And you can get a lot fancier, but let's just leave it at that. And then I want to add another sketch. I'm, I'll just take this guy right here, and I'll open up a new sketch here, because we don't want to disturb that master sketch. We want that to stay clean. So I'm going to add another sketch here. And I'm going to convert that edge. Did I open a sketch? Yes, I open a sketch. Going to convert that. And I'm going to say OK to that. And now I'm going to hide this master piece. And it's not going to let me because I don't know why. But let's just hide the sketch this way. OK, so this circle is in our new brick, believe it or not. And so then I'm just going to sweep that. So we'll go from there to there. And there's our new wire in our, that's a wire that's going to define between two and three. And just, I'll just skip a lot of uh, other similar things. We'll go back into our assembly. Let's save this. And we'll call this, what are we up to R already? What's the next one? S, uh, R, S, oh, I already did S. Uh, w, W, W. 
Should have went with numbers. They're easy to remember. Okay, so then uh, we've got our part saved. www bleh, talk, and let's go back to our assembly, which is let's go through PowerPoint to get to our assembly, and now we can just insert that part we just made, and it was called this, and we'll insert that, and. It actually brought it in and it dropped it right on the origin, which is just what we want, and there it is. So now you can see our section there. So in my opinion, this is the most efficient way to make things where you've got tons and tons of sweeps all coming together and stopping and starting and you know loops and rings and all kinds of stuff. You want to just focus on one section. And the way you define the sections is what do you need to make, what do you need to document, what do you need to show on the drawing, or what do you need to show in the assembly uh, department, you know, what do you need to show? So you define these sections so you can, see on a drawing you can just show one of those sections. You don't have to show the whole assembly, you just show one of those sections and focus on that. So it, it, it really makes life easy compared to, you know, a million configurations, a million display states, a million exploded views, assembly cuts, I mean you could go on and this, this is crazy that what this assembly looked like. And it wasn't that many parts, it was just very complicated. A lot of views of us, and it was assembly views. You know, first do this, then do this. So that that almost makes sense. Did I get my main point across there. That, and don't worry about your BM. It's never BOM. It's never going to match anyway. Okay, 15 minutes. Everybody, uh, ready to keep going? <clears throat> I have favorite physicist stories, but I don't have any more jokes. So, all right. You'll never forget how Pierce works, okay? So I always think Pierce and ice pick, okay? You've probably heard me say that before. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. Here's a plane, and we've got this, this, this is going to be the profile of our sweep, right? And then here's our path of our sweep. It's just going off more or less perpendicular to it. That's not really important. Let's edit this sketch. Because we were good, we drew the path first, and now we're going to draw the, the section, the profile, I should say. And where is this sketch piercing this sketch plane? Right? That's an ice pick. It's only piercing it in one location, right? So we've got this point right here on our circle. We want to go right where the, the ice pick is, and that's this sketch right here. So that's what a pierce is. We're gonna, the pierce is piercing the sketch in one place, and we want to take that point and put it right on there. So that's where we get a pierce. So the ice pick is the thing stabbing the sketch plane. Okay? So now let's look at that in a little bit more complex situation. Here we've got, and it's kind of, they're kind of both on top of each other. This is a planar sketch, and it's got this uh, spline in it that happens to be closed. And then here on this sketch, we've got a whole bunch of circles. So let's edit that. And we want to make this pierce over to here. So we just pick the, the single point that we want to put where this, the ice pick is stabbing it, right? Well, we, it could go anywhere. There's, there's one, two, three, four places where this spline is stabbing the, the sketch plane we're working on right now, right? So how do we know which one it's going to go to? Well, it happens that it goes to wherever it's closest to where you pick. So if I picked that circle up here, and I picked the spline down here, and I said, Pierce, it goes to the closest ice pick location that where I picked the spline. So I can get it to go anywhere. Right? Now, I, now that I know this, I can get it to go up to here and do pierce, and it comes up to there. I can go here, and I can get it to go right to there. Pierce, and it goes right where I want it. Okay, so remember, you got that single thing that's stabbing the sketch plane, and it can either stop right at the sketch plane, or it can go through the sketch plane, but it has to be a single point where it stabs the sketch, and you just take your single point in that current sketch, and you pierce it to where that ice pick was. Okay, that makes sense? Okay, now, to explain that a little further, what Pierce means, this is a really good example. Okay, 
what I'm going to try to do here, see how this side has a little shelf on it? I want to put a shelf on this side too, just like that. I've got a plane right there, and I would like to open up a sketch on that. And you would think, okay, I'm going to draw a rectangle, right? So let's draw a rectangle. Okay, now, how do I position this rectangle? So let's look at it from the top. It's always easier to do sketches when you're looking straight on, right? So let's look at it from the top. And let's take this, and we know we want it on that edge, right? Well, we can make it coincident. So you say, well, let's just make it coincident. Okay, that seemed to work, right? And then we look at it a little closer, and we say, oh, what happened? It's not on that edge. What did it do? Well, it actually, when we picked that edge, and we were looking at it straight down from the top, it took that edge that's at an angle, and it converted it straight up to the sketch plane, just like you could convert entities. Matter of fact, let's do that. Let's take that and let's convert that. So it put, that coincident went between that point on our rectangle and the coincident to that edge which as it's projected up. So if we look at it from another angle now, it makes perfect sense. There's the convert of this edge, these two, and we put a, we hit that right on. But as, but as you can see, it can go anywhere along that edge and still be coincident with it, right? So that's not at all what we wanted, even though it appears to, at first to be what we wanted. So let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of the coincident. What we really wanted was this right here is our ice pick. And we want this point on our sketch to be right on that ice pick where it's stabbing our sketch plane. That's where we really want it. So we're going to pierce instead. So Pierce isn't just for sweeps. You can use it for lots of other stuff. And then we'll take the back side of the rectangle and we'll do the same thing. We'll pierce that. And now we've got the exact rectangle we want to fill in that shelf. And we just extrude it out and, you know, take the draft and go outward and it'll fit right in there. Does that make sense? So that's why I said now you'll never forget about Pierce because you're going to visualize Phil in this ice pick and... It's a little gruesome, but you know. Okay, I'll just keep going until I'm, I got 10 more minutes. I'll just keep going. Okay, symmetry. You think of symmetry as two lines and a center line, right, in a sketch. It's, it's really a lot cooler than that. Okay, so we've got this slot. Let's edit that sketch. And we want to kind of it on these two, but we don't have any geometry. I mean, we could take these and we can convert them and then, but you don't have to convert anything. All you do is you take a center line and it always has to have a center line somewhere and we could pick the two edges, but let's play dangerously. Let's pick an edge up here that's completely not in the same sketch plane and we can make those symmetric and we get a nice big red and that's because, well, no, I, I already figured it out. I'm I've, I've actually have a, uh, a fix there for some reason. I don't know why I had it there. But there, now we've got uh, a symmetry between the edges. So it's taking those edges, it's converting them, and it's making the, sy the symmetry between those two converted edges, which it really didn't put the edges there, but it's converting it, you know. And that's how it figured out where to put, put the uh, symmetry. Same thing with this. We can do the same thing we just did, except we can go between two planes. So if we edit that sketch, pick the center line, and I don't see any fixed relationships, so we probably won't blow it up again. And we'll say symmetric, and it sh goes right between the planes. So it, it doesn't have to be things in your sketch. It can be symmetrical to things outside of your sketch. Okay? And then it also works for temporary axes. Okay? You, you'll believe me on that one, right? I, I've done it, showed enough. Okay, this is a cool one too. Let's, let's talk about the selection manager because it pops up every once in a while, but you may not use it enough to understand it, and it, it's, it's really pretty simple. So the main purpose of a selection manager is if you, here we have two sketches, and each one of them has more than one shape. So if you're doing a whole array of tubes or a whole array of wires, kind of get a theme here what I do a lot of, right? Tubes and wires. So if you uh, 
have a whole bunch of them, it's, it's kind of inconvenient to put them all in separate, just so you can do your sweeps and your lofts or your boundaries. So if you can put them all in one sketch and then just specify with that selection manager how you want to use the different closed shapes of that sketch, that, that's what selection manager is all about. So let's, uh, let's do one. Let's do a, uh, let's do a loft first. Okay, now we want to go between this sketch and this sketch, these two closed shapes, but if I pick this, it's going to want to go to all the shapes in that sketch. So we're going to pop up the selection manager, and we're going to pin it, and we're going to say auto OK selections, and we're going to go between a closed shape, and I'll pick this corner here, and then I'll say OK to that. Oh, it, it auto OK was already on, so it already did, and then I'll go to this one. And there's our loft, okay? So that's all it's just decide, you know, don't use these two closed shapes, use these two. Okay? Now a loft, I just wanted to show you the difference between a loft and a, a boundary real quick. If we go, and I'm not, there we go. Oh, oh I'll skip that for now. Let's go to boundary, do the same thing. So boundary, we still need the selection manager. We're close shape to close shape, right? I'm not getting those spheres sticking around. Well, like I said, I'll skip that right now. So now that's, that's what we use selection manager for in the boundaries and lofts. Let's real quickly go to sweeps, because this is much more interesting. So now we've got three different sketches. We've got the path, except for this little red one. And then we've got here, we've got three different profiles all in the same sketch. And then we've got, uh, oh, I pointed to that wrong. There's the three separate profiles all in the same sketch. And there's that little red sketch at the end, okay? So let's use the selection manager to do some sweeps in this case. So first we need a closed shape that is our uh, profile. So let's just pick this one. This is a real simple example. Pick that one, it filled it in. Now we need a open loop for the path, and we're gonna pick that one, and we've got a sweep. Okay, that's easy. Okay, but what we did unique is we had more closed shapes in the profile, or, or path, yeah, the profile, and we have more open shapes in the, prof in the path. I'm trying to slow down. Anyway, we've got, that's why we need the selection manager. Okay, so let's keep going with some other ones. Let's go to our sweep again. And let's uh, choose something else. Let's choose a region. So we're going to use a region for the profile. So let's just pick that region. Actually, let's pick the bottom region. Uh, that, didn't, that didn't work out. Let's clear the selections. Region is picked. That's going to be our profile. Then we go back to our path, and it's going to be this open. And now we can see we not only, oh. That wasn't expected. What did I do? Did I, I said region. OK, let's try this one more time. Clear selections. Region down there. The preview is right. Say, let's, maybe we need to close this. Yeah, the preview is still right. There we go. OK, so not only did we use the uh, specify a closed shape, we specified a region within a closed shape, and there's all these other closed shapes around it, right? So that worked out well. Now let's look at the last thing that a selection manager can do, and that's another sweep. And this time we're going to pick a closed shape, but this time we need to pick multiple things for the path. So we're going to pick this guy, and we're going to pick this sh uh, open shape and that open shape and put them both together to bind to form a group and so we can sweep along two different sketches that aren't even related or two different edges that aren't related okay okay let's let's see if we can squeeze in one more in three minutes all you got is a big party it's just right across the way it's going to be cold you got to go back to your rooms get jackets anyway so you know and it is going to be cold by the way because there's, they have those little heaters, but I didn't see any tents or anything to go in, so it's going to be cold. Ah, this, this is a good, this is a good one to end on. Okay. 
So I'll, I'll skip right to this one because this is the good one. Okay, so we come up to this part. You, you, get, you get a lot of parts that are imported, right? And they have radii on it. And, and it's really cleaner if you could get rid of all the radii and then kind of push and tug. And I'm talking about like IGIS files where you don't really have the features for you. You want to get back to before radii stage. Okay, so let's just put a radii on this real quick. And let's just do a constant, and let's do a quarter inch. And how come it's not previewing? I don't know. I, I had no preview. OK. Now, let, this is how you got it. It was imported, right? If you want to delete it and go back to no fillets, you just say delete and patch, and it goes right back. OK? That, that worked fine. Let's try that a different way. Let's put a radius on it. And this time we're going to do a face fillet. And we're going to go between there and there. And same size. OK, looks exactly the same, right? I didn't, I didn't do continuous curvature. I just said, put a fillet in there using a face. And I said, OK, same thing, delete. Delete and patch. Oh, what's going on? I can't do it. So you've got to kind of think out of the box. Think of back in the days when you first learned how to do a fillet. It seemed like sometimes it wouldn't work, sometimes it would. And you say, darn this SolidWorks, how come you're not more powerful? But over time you learned it's not so much the fillet tool, it's the way you're applying the fillets and you've got to learn the art of filleting, right? And they got easier and easier. But then you started hitting some that were difficult again. Okay, but then you figured out if I go in the right order, I'm going to be able to fillet this thing. And so you kept at it and you figured out, you know, that's the art of filleting, right? Well, that, it's kind of like that in the delete face. It's the art of deleting the face. You have to know like a specific order or you have to know tricks on how to delete the face. And I just got the one minute warning, which means they think you have somewhere else to go except out to, to the party in an hour. But I, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So, so how do we solve this? There's two things I want to show you here real quick. I'm going to take this part, and I'm going to use this plane, which goes right through the middle of it. And I am going to split this part into two bodies. And it's going to be this side and this side, right? So now we have two bodies. Now I'm going to come back to this fillet, and I'm going to delete and patch it. And it works. And then I'm going to come over to here, and guess what's going to happen on this side? Delete and patch, and it works. And then all I have to do is take those two bodies and combine them. And I'm back where I started from, except I have to actually specify the bodies, I guess. OK, there we go. So that's what we wanted to accomplish, right? OK, then Mark Biasotti came along. And he used to work for SolidWorks. He doesn't work for them any longer, if this is news to you. He stopped working for them a few months ago. But he came up with this solution. So let's go back to that same fillet that won't delete. And watch this. There's just one more. You've got, you got to see this. And then we'll stop. I'm going to add age sketch to that. Because you, if you know Mark, you know this is uh, very unique. What am I doing? OK, sketch, circle. And then we're going to make a planar face out of that. So now we've got a face up there. Now look what I'm going to do. I'm going to replace the face. So I'm going to replace face. I'm going to replace that face with that face. And you wouldn't, that you don't, this isn't the first thing you think of when you think of replacing faces. And I got that screwed up. I got to put that down there. It worked. Except we have this funny little face, but now delete face will work. So there, now we're back to where we started from. So that. It's all about the art of deleting the face, just like it's the art of filleting. Thank you very much.